My talk today is going to summarize some of the main ideas in my book, The Bitcoin Standard, and um, I'm going to try and um, keep the talk as quick as possible so that we can have more and more time for discussion. Um, as, as because generally these tend, the discussion tends to be a richer part of the um, talk. So in brief, what I'm going to be discussing today is why I think Bitcoin is unique, what Bitcoin is good for, and what are the implications of continuing to have a form of hard money that is similar to Bitcoin on various levels. So in a very brief summary of the first few chapters of my book, why is it that Bitcoin matters? In my opinion, it matters because it is hard money, or what I mean by that is, um, the, with the, to understand the dynamic, we think of it this way. Anything can basically be used as money. Anybody can hold anything and use it as a medium of exchange. But then, the, anything, that same thing can be produced in increasing quantities, which will bring down the price and therefore make it not very good as a store of value. So therefore, the, the, anything that is easy to make ends up being not very useful as a form of money. And only things that are hard to make end up succeeding in the long run as form of money. And my, the first few chapters of my book get into this in detail. Those of you who are interested can read it there. And so, be, so if we look at examples, historical examples of money, we find that anything that's chosen as money at any point in time ends up being chosen because it is hard to make at that uh, instant. And so. We look at Bitcoin, if this is true, then this is, it matters for Bitcoin because if you look at Bitcoin supply, we see that the, the supply increases at a decreasing rate and then stabilizes at 21 million. And the supply growth rate continuously decreases until it approaches zero asymptotically and then eventually the, the, the supply growth goes to zero. So the uniqueness of Bitcoin as a form of money really is the fact that with every other form of money, the fact that it gets chosen as money will increase the desire for people to produce more and more of it, which is going to increase the supply of it and bring the price of it down, except with Bitcoin. No matter how many people use Bitcoin, the supply of Bitcoin is fixed. The supply growth rate is going to be fixed. And this is, this is very different uh, than anything else we've seen. In other words, if tomorrow five people around the world are using Bitcoin only, the new supply of Bitcoins that will be minted tomorrow is going to be about 1,800 coins. On the other hand, if 5 million people or 5 billion people are using Bitcoin tomorrow, still the new supply of Bitcoins that is going to be made is 1,800. The fact that the supply is completely irresponsive and un uh, unrelated to the demand is something absolutely unique to Bitcoin amongst all monetary assets. And that, for me, I think is the most important aspect of it. And from it come all of the interesting economic ideas behind Bitcoin. The reason, really, if we want to understand why Bitcoin has gone up for so long, and you know, people say Bitcoin is a bubble, but Bitcoin has gone up about three, four hundred, or 30, 40 million percent in about um, 10 years. In less than 10 years of trading, since it started trading, since it's accrued any economic value, it's gone up by that much. That's nev there's never been a bubble like this. Nothing that's a bubble increases by the these insane amounts of it needs to do so. So how can we understand it? For me, we cannot understand it outside of understanding Bitcoin's hardness. In other words, this cycle that I, that I describe in, in, in my book, which is what differentiates Bitcoin from every other kind of money. If we look at any other kind of money, if store of value demand increases, the price rises, mining that money or printing more of it, for in the case of government money, makes it, uh, becomes more attractive. That increases the supply, which causes the price to drop. In Bitcoin, instead of the supply increasing, we don't get more supply increasing because the supply is fixed. Because of the dynamics of how mining works, which unfortunately I don't really have the time to get into right now, but you can read about them in my book. Because of the way mining works with Bitcoin, if more money goes into Bitcoin and more demand goes for Bitcoin and the price rises and mining is more attractive, we don't get an increase in the supply of Bitcoin, we get an increase in the hash power that goes into Bitcoin, which effectively makes the network more expensive to attack, which effectively means Bitcoin survives longer and continues to operate successfully and safely, which increases the store of value demand for it, which raises its price. This is really, I think, the, 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 the economic incentive feedback loop that Satoshi Nakamoto put into his code and that has been f functioning for the past 10 years and really seems to be strong enough, stronger than any of us, really. We, we, we have no choice but to submit to it because it just feeds in very well to humans' economic incentives. It's just 
it's, Bitcoin is such a well-oiled economic incentive machine that is constantly giving the world incentives to keep feeding it with the things that continue to make it run and continue to make it secure. How secure is Bitcoin? The processing power to run Bitcoin is about 7 trillion times of that in your laptop, which is an enormous amount of processing power given that it makes only half a million transactions. You could run the same number of transactions on your own uh, laptop, but the difference, of course, with Bitcoin is that we do it without having to trust you or without having to trust your laptop. It's a completely auto automated system that relies on nobody. The key thing about why Bitcoin functions, and again, I'm skipping over the technical details here, which you can read in the book, but the, the, I'm trying to get to the uh, economic uh, implications, is there's no single point of failure in Bitcoin. There's no single piece of critical hardware or infrastructure for Bitcoin to continue operating. There's no single critical individual or organization that Bitcoin needs, and Bitcoin effectively can't be stopped. Anyone who wants to join the network just needs a device that can send, uh, um, that can receive around one or two megabytes of data every 10 minutes. And that doesn't even need to be an internet connected device now. And with this economic incentive system, it is never, we've never had one bad transaction, one fraudulent transaction get confirmed in 10 years, which is an astonishing security record. So we have the hardest money that's ever invented. It's available worldwide for anyone who can receive basically two megabytes of data every 10 minutes. It's purely voluntary. It does not need regulation, enforcement, or police. And most interestingly, perhaps, it's chosen freely on the market. It gained its value on the market. Nobody forces anybody to use it as a uh, monetary uh, system. And yet people freely choose to pay with it, which is the definition that Austrian school economists like to give for sound money. It's money whose value is one on the market and determined between the people who carry out the exchange. It's not money that is enforced uh, by government. And that's really, I think, a very interesting thing about it. So with this description of the basic economic infrastructure of Bitcoin, what is Bitcoin good for? The first thing, I think the obvious thing, is that it is good as a store of value. Because it is, as I mentioned earlier, the first strictly scarce liquid asset that we have. In other words, the supply can never be increased, which is unique. For all other kinds of resources that we have, physical resources, the limit on how much we can have of each one of them is never actually how much of them exists in the crust of the earth, which is why for millions of years we've been digging in the earth and we've never run out of any actual metal that exists in earth. The reason for that is that metals, the, 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 the abundance with which we produce them is not about how much of them exists, it's about how much time we dedicate to producing them compared to other things. That's really what determines how much gold or copper or zinc or anything we have. And so more demand for copper or zinc or gold or anything is going to lead to an increase in the production of it, although that's not it, true only for one thing, and that is Bitcoin. It's the first thing that is scarce. And one of my favorite books in economics is by an economist called Julian Simon, and he, it's called The Ultimate Resource. In it, he argues that really the only resource that we have is human time, because with human time, we can make more of everything else. That's why we've never run out of anything. And with human time, we continue to define and find new technologies and new ways of making things that are more productive, and that continues to increase the productivity and continues to increase the value of our time, which is the only thing that is really scarce, whose value continues to go up over time. And so with Bitcoin, now we finally have something else that's also strictly scarce, something like our time, that whose supply can't be increased. And so for me, that sounds like it is a natural match for storing the value of the time that, that we produce, storing the value that we produce with our time, really. And so um, this, I think this is why I like to call Bitcoin you know, our most advanced technology for transferring the value of time into the future. Because with every other technology, which is what money is, money is a technology for transferring value across time, Money, uh, the most advanced way of doing it is the way that suffers the least loss. The most efficient way of converting value today into value tomorrow is always going to be the money whose supply is the least inflationary, whose supply increases the least in the long run. And so Bitcoin does this with exceptional success, so far at least, through the economic incentive structure that I mentioned earlier. And I think this is what makes it such a compelling and interesting economic phenomena. Because as soon as people start using it as a store of value, of course, the necessary function that comes along with that is that it is a medium of exchange. Those two functions are inseparable. And so it's necessary, if people want to hold it as a store of value, of course, they're going to want to exchange it. And so what we're seeing now is the development of a global 
decentralized system for the transfer of value that is the only viable alternative to global central banks. It's the only competition that central banks face in the world today. It's Bitcoin. If you want to send money today from Hong Kong to the US or to Canada or to Argentina, you have to go through the central bank and through the global central banking authorities of the world. And that's just one monopoly entity. And there are no alternatives to that. There are no legal alternatives for you to do it. There are no ways for you to be able to send money abroad outside of the control of the central bank, except with Bitcoin now. Bitcoin allows us a viable alternative to it. So then that brings up the question of does Bitcoin scale? Can Bitcoin scale? In my opinion, and as I discuss in detail in my book, Bitcoin is not going to scale as a payment network. Bitcoin is going to scale as a settlement network on which second layers will be used for consumer payments. So Bitcoin's inability to support billions of transactions per day is no impediment for it. Bitcoin's on-chain capacity and, and its, its inability to support millions of, network, of transactions per day is, I think, no comparison for it because Bitcoin doesn't compete with individual market consumer payments like Western Union or PayPal or Visa payments. It competes most likely with the settlement payments between central banks, which are high value payments that are, take a long time to confirm. Bitcoin is able to produce these payments and to send the money across the world in about an hour with getting six confirmations, which is a very high degree of certainty with it. It's an enormously compelling competitive for many people for central banks, and that's why it's been growing so massively over time. What, for me, is the most interesting implication of hard money is the fact that hard money in, in, incentivizes people to develop a low time preference. Hard money is associated with people's ability to drop their time preference. And time preference, which is really the concept that draws me into the topic of Bitcoin and the topic of money in general, um, it's something that I've always been very interested in, it refers to the uh, degree to which a person discounts the future uh, compared to the present. So everybody's time preference is positive in that everybody discounts the future compared to the present. If I offered you something today versus something tomorrow, that same thing, you would always prefer to take it today because the future is uncertain and you don't know if you're going to be around tomorrow and you prefer present enjoyment over future enjoyment. So this is of course a natural phenomenon, but our ability to hold and store value into the future, our ability to develop a store of value allows us to start developing more of a future orientation, to start discounting the future less and less. In other words, to develop a lower and lower time preference, which encourages long-term thinking, it encourages saving, it encourages the, the, the you know, saving rather than borrowing, whereas a higher time preference would, could, would incentivize spending and, and, and borrowing. And really, low time preference is what economist Han Hermann Hoppe says initiates the process of civilization. It's once people start being able to save and think of the future and they begin to accumulate capital, this increases our productivity and this allows us to improve our living standards. And this really is what allows us to build a, a civilization as, as, a, as a structure in which our lives continue to improve generation after generation through technological improvement and capital accumulation and division of labor. Ultimately, time preference is a highly important concept in it. Now, of course, here, the major criticism you'll hear of Bitcoin is that, and, and money, uh, and money, uh, forms of money that are hard like gold, is that these things are not good enough because it will cause people to stop spending money. And so if we have hard money like Bitcoin or gold, everybody's going to want to hold on to their money because the money appreciates in the future, and so people stop spending, and then if people stop spending, the economy stops working and then, you know, children die. And that's why if you hate Bitcoin, if you like Bitcoin, then obviously you hate children, right? As the newspapers always remind us. Well, it doesn't quite work this way because economy does not stop working like the Keynesians want you to believe if people stop spending because people can stop spending because people need to survive. So if you have, if you expect that the value of your money is going to appreciate in the future, yes, you're less likely to spend. But it's completely insane and completely doesn't, and, and, and doesn't, and it makes no sense to expect that you would stop spending completely. You're not going to starve yourself to death in expectation of waiting for your money to appreciate next year so that you can eat more next year because you're going to die. So consumption is necessary. We need to consume in order to survive. You need a house to live in. You need clothes to buy. So the effect of it, of a rise in uh, the value of money over time or the effect of a drop in time preference is not going to be the elimination of consumption. It's going to be the elimination of useless, needless, frivolous consumption. 
It's the elimination of people who continue to spend money on useless crap that they don't need, which you know, might sound familiar if you've been alive for the last 20, 30, 50 years or so. It's what we all do. We spend money that we don't have on stupid shit that we don't need. And you know, it, it, because that ultimately has something to do with the fact that money is expected to lose value over time, and it can't keep value. So people would indeed reduce their spending, but they won't eliminate it. And my favorite example for this is look at this hard drive from 1980 for $3,500, 10 megabytes. Why would anybody buy this in 1980 when they could just wait 30 years and buy the same thing for like five cents or 20 cents or something like that? Why? Well, because for 30 years you could get a lot of value out of this thing, and if that value exceeds the $3,500 on the time at which you purchase it, you will buy it. So the notion that the economy will collapse because people stop spending is obviously nonsensical. What happens is people start saving more, and that's why, as we see with the rise of easy money in the last 50 years, with the inflationary monetary policy, we see savings rates across the major Western economies continue to decline. The one exception, of course, Switzerland, the last country to get off the gold standard, and the one with the hardest monetary policy for quite a while. So, and of course, time preference is not just an economic factor. It's a fascinating factor that determines all kinds of manners of ways in which we take our economic decisions. And so, you know, in my book, I get in depth into the discussion of the gold standard in the 19th century and how creative and impressive that era was. And I think it's really hard to separate all of these innovations from the hardness of money and from the time preference aspect of it. And to express it, you know, I could go on with many uh, examples, but my favorite example is a picture that speaks a thousand words. That's two pictures, so that's two thousand words for you. This is your art on hard money. When people have a low time preference, Michelangelo spends four years hanging from the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel to draw this, writes a poem about it, which is quoted in my book, explains just how much of an ordeal and how it destroyed his health to produce this. But hundreds of years later, and people still travel all over the world to see this. This is art today you know, on easy money. It takes 15 minutes to produce and takes five minutes to acquire the skills needed to learn to produce it. And you know, people think these, are two, these two things are the same. I beg to differ. I think time preference is, is an important factor to keep in mind in this. And in my book, I discuss it in more and more um, detail. Uh, briefly, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to just um, I'm going to skip over the political part and just talk about the, the capital markets aspect of things. The interesting thing about Bitcoin is that uh, from the Austrian economics perspective, business cycles, recessions, unemployment, and inflation are effectively um, consequences of monetary central planning. In the same way that if you had the central planning of the market for apples, you're going to get shortages and surpluses and failures in the market for apples, the same thing happens in the market for capital. When central banks manipulate interest rates, you get all of these problems. So when the, the determination of the, central, of the interest rate is taken out of the hands of the central bank and placed in the, uh, into the market where people do uh, determine it through their own interaction, we see a much healthier kind of economy. And my example for that, again, is Switzerland, my favorite example. Up until the 1970s, Switzerland basically had no unemployment because they were on a gold standard. They had no inflation, they had no unemployment. That's what an economy should be like. If you don't have an inflationary central bank, this is what normal life looks like. We've normalized the idea that inflation, unemployment, and recessions are just a normal part of life, but they're not. They're a normal part of centrally planned manipulated capital markets, just like market failures are a normal part of all kinds of manipulated markets. And finally, the opportunity to have one global neutral monetary standard is truly an intriguing one. If you think about it in the long run, if Bitcoin continues to grow, it would likely develop into some kind of monetary system where you know, finally we get over the problem of needing to exchange money across political borders, which is effectively a system of international barter. And it's, it's, it's one of the worst things that happened in the 20th century that we moved back to a system of partial barter across the world rather than a system of global free trade on one money, as was the case in the 19th century on the gold standard. So Bitcoin allows us to do something like this because it is resistant to government control and inflation in that regard. Um, there's more uh, discussion on energy markets, but I think I'm running out of time for now. Um, if interested in learning more, you could find my book. It's now out in 13, it's out in five languages and getting translated to a total of 13 languages, including Chinese, uh, simplified and traditional Chinese. 
And if interested, I'm also producing a monthly research report to which you can subscribe on my Patreon. And I'm soon going to be producing online courses and lectures and seminars, interactive online seminars on Austrian economics and on content related to Bitcoin, which you can sign up for. So if you have more interest in learning more about my work, these are your resources. Thank you very much.